Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day, and thank you for joining us today. The Our Driving Concern Employer Traffic Safety Program is pleased to be able to offer the webinar Aftermath of a Fatality in the Workplace, Part 2. This is an interactive style webinar today, and we will be hearing from Carl Carlson, Safety Director with Becco Contractors, and he will be interviewed by Lisa Robinson, Senior Program Manager with the National Safety Council. A few things to note before we get started. Everyone should be muted, but just in case, if you would just go ahead and hit star six, just to make sure. This is going to silence any background noise, and it's going to ensure confidentiality for all attendees. So again, star six on your phone should ensure that everyone is muted. You do have the ability to type questions during the webinar, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation. A PDF of the presentation was made available for your note taking, and if you had any problems printing it off, please let me know. If you should encounter any problems or issues in the presentation, please type a message to let us know. Presenter's contact information will be available on the last slide. And there's a very brief post-event survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Because this program is funded through grant dollars and provided at no cost to employers, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. And again, if everyone would hit star six on their phone just to make sure that the background noise is silenced and then it will again ensure confidentiality for all attendees. And with that, I welcome Carl and Lisa and we will turn it over to over to them to begin. Thank you, Deanne. Thank you, Carl, for joining me again today. How are you? Doing good. How are you? Thank you for having I'm me. I'm good. Well, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're willing to do this because I know last week we were I think so many people really appreciated. We got a lot of positive comments on the webinar. So I'm glad that you've got the ability now to kind of come back in. And I know today you're still going to be touching on some of the same components that we touched on before, you know, some of the um, objectives that we, that we discussed last time, meaning, you know, the emotional aspects that the um, safety manager has, um, some of the liability, the risk, you know, the cost, the different pieces that come into play. So I'm excited that you have the ability to share more about that with, with our, our listeners today and other risk and safety managers. So, you know, last week you told us kind of what happened. And so some people may be new, some may have been here last week. Can you kind of, in a nutshell, give us a little bit about what happened um, that brought us to this point about the fatality? Sure. Uh, we had a, uh, a supervisor driving a company truck. Uh, he was done for the day working uh, on his way home. Um, ended up having a, a wreck uh, on his way home. Uh, ended up in a double fatality. And that basically set everything in motion. So, so there was a double fatality, and this was a, a supervisor that you mentioned that was driving a company vehicle, right? That's kind of yes, what, yes. what I, I'm getting. Okay. So let's talk about, you know, we talked about a lot of other components last week. So let's talk about a little bit about the cost. Because as an employer, you know, when you say crash of any kind, the first thing that probably an employer is thinking about is what is this? cost, correct? So let's talk a little bit more about what the company experienced with costs relating to that crash and the fatality. So can you share some of the things that um, the company was experiencing with costs? Well, you've got, uh, you know, insurance costs, um, you've got uh, lost time cost, um, staff cost, uh, you've got staff time cost, you've got potential, you know, insurance uh, liabilities. You've also got attorney costs. There's multitude of costs that go in the, into a claim uh, of this nature. So tell me, when it talks about, like, staff time, tell me a little bit more about what were some of the things that that you guys were calculating when you were trying to figure out the costs that, you know, it might have not been actual things that you paid out of your pocket, but things that, you know, when you say staff time, tell me what that means when you say staff time. Well, there's a lot of information that you'll be asked to collect uh, in a case of this nature. 
so you're not able to do it yourself. So you've got to get the help of staff. So not only do they have to do their normal jobs, as you will, uh, you've also got to collect uh, this. So you may have you know, ex compounded time or even overtime hours of collecting information. And, and when you're collecting information on this, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that you know, it's a lenient deal. When when you're asked for information, it needs to be received in almost immediate. You need to get on that. That's your high priority. So you're going to set other things aside, um, get the information that's needed, and then go back to your, your normal stuff. So that's going to extend time. So the cost there, um, when you're going in uh, – Meetings for this, you've got uh, those costs. You know, you got supervisors that may have to come in, and and uh, attorneys may want to meet with them. Uh, so you've got those hours and, and lost production time, um, depositions. Uh, you've got to plan for those. Those are uh, paid for, and then any time, any court times, uh, any any court appearances that that have to be taken, you've got to take those into account. So what are you guys, what, how did you account for that? Because I'm thinking in your position and some of the other staff, you know, that means that's lost productivity. That means you're not doing your actual job that you've been hired to do because you're having to do all of these other things or be in these meetings. Or So did that mean you guys had to hire more staff? No, not hire more staff. You basically, you take care of the, the hot ticket item. And then in hours that you normally wouldn't be working, you're taking care of your normal normal job. A little more stress, probably. Yeah, it's a lot more stress. Yes, yes. And and one of the things that we we mentioned that's one of our key points is training. So as a result of this fatality, you know, what about the training? So does that mean that maybe you're looking at doing additional training, or you you may think that there might be need for additional training? So then again, you're going to have more costs, whether it's the program, a speaker, or whatever it might be. Uh, you can if the, if, you, if additional training is identified, then. You'd obviously have the cost of the trainer and the program and then uh, the cost of everybody attending. Um, through this training here was basically just, you know, getting the word out of actually what had happened, uh, what the uh, causes and aspects uh, of something like this happening to somebody else, what they could expect potentially to go through. So that means lost productivity. So if you're pulling everybody off the job to go to these meetings or trainings, then there's lost, a little bit of lost productivity at that time, correct? Yes, yeah, ma'am. So what about the insurance deductible? How does that come into play? I mean, I'm going to assume right then and there you have your deductible, but how does that in the future impact your insurance cost as a result of this fatality? Well, your insurance deductible can go up. Uh, it can also, if, it's, uh, if you've had enough uh, claims in the past and you're uh, – Loss ratio is high. You could end up, uh, uh, your insurance could end up uh, not renewing you or canceling you, and then you're going to have to go out and find an insurance company that will insure you. So you've got uh, potential, you know, higher deductibles uh, in the future, uh, and could even be as soon as right then. So we talked about in the future we might have higher insurance deductibles. Um, what about the future when you start talking about the emotional impact? Did you notice any emotional impact on yourself as a safety director or any coworkers or um, the employee that was affected by this? Uh, the emotional aspect, uh, definitely. I mean, you had, uh, you know, as far as other employees that uh, may have been involved in this, uh, you know, they probably never seen the inside of a courtroom. So they're real nervous. They're emotionally high, you know. So you've got that aspect. On that, when you turn it to myself and, and the safety and risk, uh, the emotions are, are way high. I mean, you're you go through something like this and fade out, and it's not you know just you. It's it's everybody. It's it's the the families with the the fatalities. You know, their emotions are are high. You're your emotional aspect, your mental emotion, dealing with everything, because there's a lot of things when you go through this that you're not allowed to talk about. Uh, you can't talk about it with anybody because it could potentially hurt an outcome of somebody's testimony or, or you know, they could even say you're trying to tamper with a, a witness by feeding them information. So you're, if you're the representative of the company, you hold a lot of that stuff and have to deal with that stuff. 
and mentally and emotionally, it's tough. Wow. So I didn't even think when you made the comment about the family member's emotional aspect, I was thinking of the employee and maybe coworkers and yourself and the job that you do. So I, I had not thought really initially about that family, but that's definitely another component there. And so yep. when we talked about, you know, the impact costs, we did talk about insurance costs going up. What other costs were impacted in the future? I mean, we know that there was probably some legal costs, but what else might you see if there would there could there have been I mean, I don't know that there were, but could there ever have been fines assessed by anybody as a result? Could that be a cost that a, a company might might have? You could. Uh, a company in a court case like this, uh, if it went to court on a civil side, you had the uh, the potential for punitive damages. Uh, in, in any case, not, not just specific to this, in any case you have, uh, could be punitive damages. And when we're talking punitive damages, that's something the insurance company doesn't cover. So that that is straight from the company's pocketbook. Okay. Um, when you get into punitive, you, you could, you could definitely, uh, definitely, company could definitely go under. So if it's a small company, a punitive damage, you know, could actually put them out of business. Basically, is what you're, what I'm hearing you say. They yes, couldn't absorb that. Okay. No, so one thing I want to ask you, and you've, you've used this term multiple times, and we've had conversations, and we've talked about this and just some different things, and you use the term negligent entrustment, and I think it's such a big term. And through our conversation, it's got a big definition, and you said, let me simplify it for you. And so could you share how do you simplify and how, what's the analogy would you, you would use with negligent entrustment? The best analogy I like to use, because it doesn't matter whether you're a small company or a huge company, it works the same. If you've got a, let's say you need a delivery driver, you go out, you take somebody's application, you hire them as a delivery driver, you say, okay, hey, you got a driver's license? Yep. They got a driver's license, you put them in a delivery truck, they go make a delivery for you, they have an accident, and let's say it's not even as bad as a fatality. Let's say it's just an injury accident where the other party's injured in that. Well, you're going to get sued, and then they're going to want to know how you determined that driver was right to put in the truck. Well, he said he had a driver's license. Yes. Did you do a check, a driver's license check, see what was on their background of their check? No. Well, they come to find out when you, they run the MVR and they bring it up in court or even through the, the claim, you know, the driver's got a DUI, he's got several speeding tickets, you know, he's had a license suspended in the past. Uh, it could even be suspended now uh, because if you look at a person's driver's license, they pull out their wallet or purse, it doesn't say it's suspended. It just gives you a effective date and a renewal date. So if you haven't done that, that's a perfect example of negligent entrustment. You can be in a lot of trouble for that, basically. A lot of trouble, yes. So um, one of my questions I was going to ask you is why it's important. Well, you can get in a lot of trouble. Is that legal trouble or is that financial trouble? Is that, I mean, or is it, tell me what kind of well, trouble you can was, get into. You can get into legal trouble, uh, you know, especially if uh, they found out you didn't do your due diligence of checking to ensure that that driver was uh, uh telling the truth and they were ample and able and didn't have, you know, had a good driving record and you put them in a vehicle and they, you hadn't checked that, uh, you're going to have legal issues, um, financial, because if it's found that it's a negligent entrustment, I can guarantee you that it'll be a punitive claim. So tell me another big term I think is negligent hiring. It's similar to negligent entrustment, but has a different meaning. So tell me a little bit, Simplify this definition of negligent hiring for me. The easiest simplification on that because you can't just bulk around and say, okay, somebody's got a background, you can't hire them. That's just that's not even uh, legal. You have to take each case by case. So an easy way to say negligent hiring is, uh, let's say you're going to hire a, uh, a person to take over your uh, retirement accounts to help uh, employees invest in there or sign up for it and things like this, and they've got control of that. You didn't check their background, and then all of a sudden, all the retirement money is gone. And then it's found out this person did it, and they had been charged in the past with embezzlement. That's a negligent hiring. You you didn't do a background check to check and see if that person was qualified or if there was something. I mean, you're not going to hire somebody with an embezzlement background to take care of your account. So in those aspects... 
that's going to play a part. So how do you protect the company and how do you use the safety? How are you protecting yourself? Um, I know you mentioned the background check. Is there something else that you can do to protect yourself when it comes to negligent hiring? You do a background check. Um, you do uh, MVR checks. Um, and I I follow the 49 CFR. Uh, you know, we, we do an annual uh, MVR check of anybody who's driving a vehicle. Um, you also do the background checks, you know, and, and you just got to, like I said, you can't make a blanket policy. Um, you know, we're not hiring anybody with a background. That doesn't really go with the law, so you have to take it case by case. You know, if a person comes in and let's say they, they may be driving and you see that they've had, uh, you know, they've been convicted of, uh, let's just say, a negligent homicide or a vehicle or manslaughter or even, you know, uh, three or four accidents uh, running a stop sign and, and causing an accident, uh, there's no way I'd ever put them in a vehicle. So one of the things that I, I asked you when I was thinking about this was, you're a safety guy. You're the safety director, right? You're not yes, HR. But, but, and some of the components you're just mentioning, it's really kind of an HR task, if you will. So tell me, how does a company have um, good crossover to ensure that the safety director and your HR and your human resources and your risk, you know, that they're all on the same page with your employees? Yeah, you know, safety, safety is part of HR and risk. I know a lot of a lot of people, a lot of companies don't think that. Um, you've got to work all together. You know, if, if safety's saying, hey, listen, if you don't uh, check this or don't do this, or if we don't try them this way, we could be open to something. You know, if you've got an HR person that's over HR and they're like, no, you know, I, I don't see that, then you're going to open yourself up. Safety, risk, and HR have to be close, tied, hand in hand, and they need to work together. If they're not, then you've got a potential for a, a huge problem. So let's talk a little bit about um, risk and liability because we've mentioned that a little bit as far as we go. You know, some of the things that an employer faces when anything occurs, um, injury, crashes, anything that happens in the workplace, you know, automatically, and we've talked a lot about liability. And, of course, there can be some employee liability as well, right? There can be some consequences that an employee is going to face that's not, on the employer side, right? Correct. Uh, you know, let's say a uh, uh, fatal vehicle fatality, uh, they could be criminally charged, uh, and that is something that uh, you know, employer and the insurance company doesn't handle. Uh, a, a criminal charge is all on the employee for them to hire attorneys, take care of that criminal side. But at the same time, that aspect of that criminal trial affects the civil trial. Right. So let's talk a little bit about, um, I know we talked about, you know, some consequences for that employee. You know, there could be an impact as far as um, citations for the company as well, right? Um, there's risk that's available and, you know, your cost, um, off-the-job behavior, because this is an off-the-job, even though it was, was in a company vehicle, you know, your fringe costs are impacted too by your employees. Um, so tell me something. What about your policies? When we talk about risk and liability, are you guys looking at your policies and are you consistently reviewing those policies to ensure that you're protecting yourself to the fullest? You do, and you have to. I mean, you know, they, there's little law changes that happen all the time, and you need to be uh, abreast on those and make sure that your policies and procedures uh, reflect those and, and you're covered by it. And I don't mean covered, you know, trying to get out of something, but that you're protecting uh, the drivers, uh, your employees, as well as the company. Because let's say, let's say a company's not, not protecting anything. You've got employees that are dependent on feeding their families, and if you're not looking at that, it can shut it down and, and everybody's out of a job. And you're sense. affecting the general public, you know, if you're not up on this and you didn't see this and it affects uh, another family in the public and, you know, in the community, uh, that's a huge impact as well. So are a lot of decisions that your company or a company in general is going to make, is it to be evaluating, you know, what the risk would be and, you know, to reduce your exposure to, to liability and all the things that might come? So a lot of the decisions are you trying to be, you know, preventative and proactive? Preventative and proactive is the best way to be. Uh, you don't want to be reactive. 
And the difference is, is uh, you're looking for those small changes, uh, reduce exposure, reduce risk. Uh, let's say you've got a driver that's taken one route, and then you've noticed that uh, you know there's been several crashes on that route. Let's don't send them that route. Let's route them around another way uh, that hasn't had it. Yeah, it may take a few minutes longer, but you've reduced that risk that there could potentially be another accident involving yourself and somebody else. So just those little things of that nature. I mean, you don't want to be reactive. You know, reactive is never good. Uh, you know right. that 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 route causes has caused a lot of accidents, and you continue to send your vehicles that away hoping that something doesn't happen, then when it does, then you change them to another route. That's reactive. That's never good in any situation. So you're thinking in the, in the beginning. I love that. Um, so let's kind of move on and think about safety. You know, one of the things that you kind of said to me, I think, in some of our conversations is, you know, it, I'm the safety guy, but you know what? It's everybody's responsibility at the company, right? It's, it's, it's you know, it it's the HR, it's the upper management, it's, it's every employee, right? It's everybody's job to be thinking safety. It is everybody's job uh, because it affects everyone. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, a, a fatality off the job uh, that affects the, the company or the employees, or it's a, a accident, injury, or even a fatality on the job. It affects everybody, and if everybody's not thinking safety, you got a lot of work to do. So as a result of this particular fatality and this particular crash, what changed about safety in your company? Can you kind of give me an idea if there was any specific changes? Did it expand the view of the, the company or upper management or anybody else? No, you know, really going through uh, a case like this, um, as I said before, you're not, not allowed to talk about uh, many, many aspects, and you definitely don't want to talk uh, to your employees or anybody outside the need-to-know circle. Uh, while the case is going on. Um, you don't want to get rumors or speculation started or anything like that. So the the time from the case open till when it closes or, or settles or whatever um, is a stressful time for you because you're really wanting to tell these guys what the potential could be for them and not only in the company but their personal lives as well. So once it, uh, this case was concluded, I was able to meet with uh, my drivers and employees and, and give them a synopsis of what happened and what could happen. You know, even if they had a, a fatality in in their own vehicle, you know, on the weekend away from work, that they could be fi found with criminal charges and have to deal with that. So that kind of op was able to open everybody's eyes to, hey, wait a minute, you know, this this is a real scenario so it's not just like reading a tailgate meeting uh and right. seeing those things or or you know going to a, a seminar or hearing a webinar about somebody else's experiences it was something tangible that unfortunately happened and to let everybody know that hey this is a real person these were real people it did happen to us and here's why i preach this down you know if i tell you something's wrong this is why I'm not just doing it to throw out policies or throw out safety or anything like that. I want you to understand it's for your benefit and the benefit of others. So being able to discuss this with the employees and, and open their eyes to, to what actually happened um, and without going into a lot of detail on it, obviously, um, was better for safety because they understood where I was coming from with what I'm trying to tell them and, and policies and regulations that are put in to protect them. So it sounds like when you had this conversation after it occurred, those employees probably took something from it. I know you mentioned like safety talks are really great, but when you were able to say this is exactly what happened to our company, this is exactly what happened to our driver, you know, everyone needs to understand that these are things that could, could happen to you. Did you see any differences with that employee base? Uh, you do. Uh, everybody's more attentive, and, and they they let newer employees coming on uh, know, and and it, so it helps expand the safety, uh, and and helps develop and strengthen your safety culture that you have. You know, one of the big things is you know that I've seen with them is when I explain the difference between a civil and a criminal. 
and uh, they couldn't understand that you know they're they're driving a company vehicle why isn't criminal covered well you can go look at your own insurance policy on your vehicles personally owned and you will find that they will not cover any criminal charges and some may not even cover civil but as a company civil civil charges are are covered under certain aspects and there are some different exemptions in there but for the for most part uh civil sites covered criminal is never covered right. so seeing their eyes open and understanding that hey yeah okay company but well i'll check with my insurance see what they say and then when they come back say man i didn't even realize that that's that's when you're saying okay great we got something something out of this this person's going to understand and and help tell others well, I've got a couple final thoughts that I kind of want to ask you just a couple questions as we start to wrap up here. I want to ask you, um, tell me, how did this particular incident impact you personally and professionally? Uh, personally, uh, personally, you learn a lot about yourself. Uh, I learned a lot about myself that I could handle something like this. Uh, that I didn't want to handle this in the future, and, you know, obviously, but and to be able to help take steps to prevent it. Um, professionally, I mean, it, really anything. I mean, I look at the legality of any claim, even something like a, a mailbox claim. You know, one of our drivers mm-hmm. run over a mailbox. You look at the legal aspects of that. What could come from that? Why did it happen? How you look at the legal aspects on anything, and and that's that's the main things that really come out of that. So, um, tell me, what is something that the attendees today could take away? What is something that you think about the impact that is really important for the attendees today to, to take away from today's webinar? Look at how you're doing doing things. Um, don't be closed to, you know, you attended the webinar. This is a story of something that happened to somebody else. Uh, look at it. Look at your own own practices, uh, how you're doing things in your company. Um, ask questions. Ask questions to your attorneys. Ask questions to your insurance. Uh, they will all be more than happy to, to answer questions. Uh, for you that come up, but do everything you can to get prepared. If you think you're prepared, look over it and ask those questions to your insurance or to your private attorneys. Ask them to take a look at it. It's it's not a you're an incompetent because you're asking for somebody to look at your stuff. You're just wanting to be better prepared. Be proactive and not reactive. I think that's a I think that's a great point. I mean, I love the fact that you're talking about being, you know, proactive. I think that's a really important thing to think about with safety in general, whether we talk transportation, whether we're talking a crash or anything in the work environment to be proactive when it comes to safety. Um, I really want to thank you so much for everything that you shared last week and this week. Um, I think you've provided a lot of information to the attendees. And this is, is Deanne said this is going to be archived on the website so anybody can go back and listen to either one. And I think you've brought a lot in. Um, so thank you so much for your time, Carl. And, and Deanne, do you have any closing remarks? I don't. I, was, I wanted to ask um, if anyone had any um, questions before we um, wrapped up today. I'll give anyone just a quick uh, if they had any questions to type in. Okay. Well, thank you, Carl and Lisa. And this was such a, a great webinar, very educational. Um, we also want to thank everyone who's attended. Um, we know your time is very valuable, and we hope you gain some useful information um, that you can use going forward. And, and like Lisa said, uh, both of these um, parts to this series will be archived um, within um, the next week or so, so you can be checking the websites for those. And um, if you would, please take a quick moment and fill out the post-survey um, webinar and then um, check our uh, website for future webinars. And we, we definitely try to bring you helpful information in a quick and easy format that you can take back to your organization and start using immediately. So with that, again, we thank you, and we hope you have a, a great rest of the day and happy Valentine's.
Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Deanne. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a great day. You too. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>